Chapter 7 of Captain Salt in Oz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Captain Salt in Oz by Ruth Plumley Thompson. Chapter 7 Strange Specimens for Samuel Salt. With no one to challenge their going but the birds and monkeys, the little band made its way back to the sandy beach. Tandy, perhaps because he had been so long pent up in the silent jungle, and because he was by nature a naturally sober and solemn little boy, said nothing. Not even the crescent moon, riding so proudly at her anchor, seemed to arouse any interest or enthusiasm in this strange young Ozamalander. "'Well, here we are!' exclaimed Ato, heartily thankful to be in sight of the ship again. "'And I hope you'll not mind ferrying us out to the boat, Nicobo. Those crocodiles still look hungry, and I've no notion of being crocked for the rest of my life.' "'Any time you say,' grunted the hippopotamus, squeaking a listless greeting to a company of her own relatives, who were rolling lazily about in the muddy river-water. Avast in belay, and what's the hurry? Leaning his axe against a tree, Samuel moistened a finger and held it up. The wind's against us, mate, so we'll have to wait for the tide. Not only that, but Roger and I must survey the island and dig up some more interesting specimens to take back to the ship. After a long and rather quizzical look at Tandy, Samuel turned and swung along the beach, the reed bird flapping joyously behind him. "'Run up and down a bit,' advised Ato, sliding down from Nokobo's back. "'Your legs must need stretching. Wonder if there's anything to eat around here, or hereabouts. Aha! Those look like oranges. A wild orange grove, as I'm a cook and a seaman. Come along, young one, and help me gather a few.' "'A king and a son of a king's son does not come and go at another's bidding.' announced Tandy, stiffly, alighting from the hippopotamus. "'Merciful mothers! What's this?' gasped Ato, blinking his eyes rapidly. "'As complete a case of ingrowing royalitis as I've ever had the misfortune to encounter. Well, since it's every king for himself, then I'll be leaving you, Sonny, and son of a king, Sonny. Watch out for him, Kobo. He's probably real important to himself.' "'You should not speak like that,' reproved the hippopotamus as Ado disappeared into the orange grove. "'After all, the big and fat one is himself a king.' "'Pooh! King of some potty little island!' sniffed Tandy, leaning wearily against a palm. "'Break me a coconut, Kobo. I'm thirsty.' With a discouraged sigh, Nikobo trod on one of the coconuts, cracking it from end to end, and then, because she was a generous and kindly creature, she cracked several more for Ato when he should return. Sitting back on her haunches, she anxiously watched while Tandy downed the coconut milk, then, stretching out in the sand, fell unconcernedly asleep. Thus Ato found them when he emerged from the orange grove an hour later. His elegant explorer's cape was knotted to form a sack, and bursting full of the small sweet fruit of the wild orange trees. "'These will make us a fine mess of marmalade when I get back to the ship,' panted the perspiring monarch, settling down with his back cosily to Nabokos. "'How's young Saucebox?' "'All right,' the hippopotamus nodded in Tandy's direction. "'He's so small and tired,' she murmured worriedly and you must know he has been exposed in an open cage in the jungle for five long months, with only a miserable hippopotamus for company." "'Miserable hippopotamus!' snorted Ato indignantly. "'You're a very superior animal, my girl. I consider it an honor to converse with you any day. Did you crack those coconuts for me?' As Nikobo, trying bashfully to conceal her pleasure at Ato's praise, admitted she had, the king took several long, satisfying draughts from the shells. "'Now, don't you worry about that young sprout,' he advised kindly as Nikobo continued to gaze mournfully at the sleeping boy. "'We'll make allowances for his high and mighty littleness and set him down in his own country. That is, if we ever manage to find it, 
though I must say he'll not be much use nor company for us. Ahoy! Here comes Semmy. Wonder what he's found. As a matter of fact, the Royal Explorer of Oz looked more like a walking window box than a seaman. Long vines hung from his neck and trailed from his pockets. His arms were crammed with spiked and prickly plants, and on his head he balanced a package of seashells tied up in his shore-going coat. "'What are you going to do, start a conservatory?' roared Ado as Roger helped the captain set his treasures on the ground. "'Rare and unusual, all of them,' said Samuel, dropping down beside Ado and looking with complete satisfaction at his curious collection. "'Mind those yellow creepers,' warned Nikobo, wiggling her vast snout warningly. "'Those purple-flowered plants in the middle are treacherous, too. "'They are tumbleweeds, Master Longlegs, and tis from them Patrippany Island gets its name. "'When the leopard men fought, they would fling these weeds at one another, "'and I've seen them falling about for hours, neither side being able to advance a step or even stand up.' "'Tumbleweeds!' breathed Samuel ecstatically. "'You don't say! Why, these might come in real handy if we ever get in a tight place. I'll give a few to the Wizard of Oz and to the Red Jinn when we get back from this voyage. And what about the yellow creepers, mate? Are they fighting plants, too?' "'The creepers, if uprooted and thrown at an animal or man, will creep rapidly after him, catching him no matter how fast he runs and tying him up so tight he will not be able to move until the vine withers,' explained Nikobo solemnly. "'I happen to know from an experience I had with one of these vines in my early youth.' "'Creeping vines!' shivered Ato, moving as far away from Samuel's collection as possible. "'Just keep them away from me, Sammy. What right have such things on a ship?' "'Oh, they'll be harmless enough when they're putted,' answered Samuel easily. "'And a splendid weapon they'll make for some up-and-coming country.' "'Better keep them for ourselves,' advised Roger, fluttering down to Samuel's shoulder. "'Exploring's a dangerous business, if you ask me, Master Salt.' "'Well, you'll have to admit that it's been pretty safe and successful so far.' said Samuel, clasping his hands behind his head and gazing contentedly up at the waving fronds of the palm-trees. "'Safe?' the ship's cook began to shake and quiver all over. "'Ho, ho! Safe? Especially sailing round that volcano and going swimming with the crocodiles? Safe! You'll be the death of me yet, Samuel!' "'Have you planted your Oz flags and told the wild creatures of the jungle about the new sovereign?' Roger nodded his head importantly. "'We've raised Oz flags on the tallest trees on the east, south, west, and north sides of the island. I flew across and got a bird's-eye view while the captain walked clear round. We've discovered it's bean-shaped, King Deer, the exact shape of a kidney-beam, and a fine fertile place for settlers and prospectors from Oz.' "'Yes, all they have to do is cut down a million trees, drain the swamps, and train the wild beasts in the jungle to be as polite and considerate as Nikobo here.' "'Well, what of it? That's their problem.' Samuel stretched himself, luxuriously snapping each finger to see that it was still working. "'And now, since our part is done, what do you say to waking this son of a king's son and getting aboard the ship? The tide'll run out in a couple of hours and carry us along.' Tazander had been awake for some time, listening to the conversation with closed eyes. Now, sitting up, he calmly spoke his mind. "'I'm not going with you,' he stated grandly. "'I'm going to stay here with Kobo till my own people come for me.' "'Ha! Mutiny!' Leaping to his feet, Samuel glared down at the puny youngster with real anger and exasperation. If you think I'm going to leave you on this island to be devoured by wild animals when Nikobo's back is turned, you don't know your pirates. Climb up on that animal. Lively now!" Samuel looked so fierce and threatening, Ato felt rather sorry for the stubborn little king, but he was wasting his sympathy. "'I'm not going,' said Tandy, settling more determinedly down into the sand. "'And no one can make me.' "'Don't say that! Don't say that! 
blubbering with grief at the thought of losing her small charge and shivering with anxiety lest he arouse to further anger this tall sea-captain, Nikobo lumbered to her feet and began to whisper eagerly in Tandy's ear. During this short conference Samuel gathered up his specimens and Ato his oranges, and when both had finished the hippopotamus edged nervously forward. "'I've decided to go with you,' she announced in a slightly shaken voice. "'If I go, Tandy'll go. So I'll just go.' "'What?' roared Samuel Salt, dropping his shells and clapping his hand to his forehead. "'Well, that practically solves everything.' Looking wildly from the hippopotamus to the crescent moon, Samuel had a dreadful vision of Nikobo rolling dangerously from side to side of his cherished vessel. "'What'll you eat?' demanded Roger, who was ever more practical than polite. "'How'll we ever feed this enormous lady, Cook dear? Besides, she'll sink the ship.' "'I'll be very quiet and stay wherever you put me,' murmured Nikobo in a meek voice. "'I'll go on a diet and eat whatever is left.' "'Well, why couldn't she go?' proposed Ato, who already had formed a great liking for Tandy's devoted guardian. "'Why couldn't she? Nice, kind, motherly creature that she is.' "'But a hippopotamus needs fresh water and tons of food, and—' Then suddenly Samuel brought his hands together with a resounding smack. "'Have you thought of something?' asked Ato hopefully, shifting his oranges from one shoulder to the other. Yes, stated the former pirate solemnly. I have. Samuel was secretly delighted to have found a way to carry this superb herbivorous specimen back to Oz. I'll build her a raft and tow her along after the ship. We'll stop at all the islands we come to for fresh water and grass, and meanwhile she'll have to do with salt baths and such food as we have in the hold. Oh, Kobo, do you hear that? Springing up with the first signs of life or feeling he had yet shown, Tandy flung himself on his huge champion and friend. "'So you're really going. Then I'll go, too.' "'Can't be all bad, if he's as fond of her as all that,' whispered Ato into Samuel's ear. "'Not bad. Just a pest,' wheezed Samuel, reaching for his axe. "'Needs a taste of the rope, if you ask me.' Then, while Nikobo went for a last swim in the Biggin Little River and bade good-bye to her numerous and wondering relatives, Samuel felled trees, split wood, and with nails Roger fetched from the ship fashioned a splendid strong raft for their new pet. Round the edge he built a sturdy railing to keep Nikobo from sliding off in a rough sea. Ato and Roger, taking thought for the evening meal, heaped one end of the raft with grass and twigs and all the jungle roots they could gather. Without moving or offering to help, Tandy sat watching, and just as the sun sank down behind the palms, a strange procession started out for the crescent moon. Ahead, with the keg of nails, soared Roger. Then came the hippopotamus, moving like a small dreadnought through the water. On her back sat Ato, the haughty young king of Ozamaland, and Samuel Salt. Samuel rode last holding in his hand the long cable he had attached to the raft and with which he meant to fasten it to the crescent moon. Following his orders, Nikobo swam close to the side of the ship so Tandy and Ato could climb the rope ladder, then she paddled round to the stern where Samuel drew his cable through an iron ring in the ship's hull and made the raft fast. There was a runway at the back of the raft, and the rails on that side let down so that Nikobo had no trouble clambering aboard. By pulling a rope with her teeth, she could raise or lower the back of her pen, and take a swim whenever she felt the need of one. After giving her a bit of advice about voyaging, and seeing her comfortably settled, Samuel climbed the cable and nimbly pulled himself aboard his ship. Roger had already stowed their precious specimens in the hold, and rubbing his hands with brisk satisfaction, the captain of the Crescent Moon weighed anchor and dropped with the tide down the big and little river to the sea. Then, touching the automatic controls, he set his sails to catch the evening breeze, adjusted his steering gear for a course east by southeast, and strode happily into his cabin. The salamander chirped cheerfully as he passed her hot-box, and after tapping a cheerful greeting on the lid, 
the weary explorer stripped off his ruined and muddy shore-going outfit, took a shower, and climbed thankfully back into his old sea-clothes. "'Where's the pest?' he called out as Roger flew past the open port. "'Well, since he was small and important,' sniffed the reed-bird, waving a claw, "'I gave him a large cabin to himself. I didn't think you and Ato would want him in here.' "'Shiver my timbers, no!' Samuel looked ruefully across at the small berth the Philadelphia boy occupied on their last voyage. "'He'll never be the seaman Peter was, nor the company either. He'd better keep out of my way, ha, or I'll give him a taste of my belt!' Snatching up his spyglass and looking as stern as a kind-hearted pirate well can, Samuel hurried out on deck. Meanwhile, in the cabin next to the captain's, Tandy stood regarding himself mournfully in the small glass over his sea-chest. He too had taken a shower, and at Roger's suggestion had donned one of Peter's old pirate suits. "'I am a king and the son of a king's son,' muttered Tandy, staring sadly at the sallow reflection in the mirror. To tell the truth, the suit was not in the least becoming to the skinny and sullen young monarch. I am a king and son of a king's son, and can bear anything," he repeated dismally. "'Then bear a hand with the dinner!' yelled Roger, who had been peeking at him through the porthole. "'All who eat must work, and under the hatches with lubbers!' Pretending not to hear, Tandy sat resignedly on the side of his bunk, though he really was curious to look around the ship and see what Koba was doing. From the galley came the cheerful rattle of pots and pans and the huge voice of Ato singing as he prepared the dinner. Gulls flew in excited circles all round the crescent moon, calling out their hoarse challenge and farewell, and Samuel Salt, leaning on the taffrail, gazed dreamily back at Patrippany Island. The Oz flags fluttering from the tall palms gave it quite a gay and festive appearance, and in spite of not seeing the leopard men, Samuel felt he had done a good day's discovering. "'Ahoy! Below! How you coming?' called Samuel, leaning down to look at Nikobo. The hippopotamus wagged her huge head. "'Fine! Just fine, mate!' she wheezed pleasantly. "'Ha! Good for you!' Samuel's face broke into a broad grin as Koba remembered to call him mate. "'We'll make an able-bodied sea-woman of you yet, my lass!' End of chapter 7「Chapter 8 of Captain Salt in Oz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Captain Salt in Oz by Ruth Plumley Thompson Chapter 8 Maxims for Monarchs When Ato, banging boisterously on an iron frying-pan with a wooden spoon, summoned all hands to dinner, Samuel and Roger responded with a rush but Tandy remained sitting gloomily on his bunk. "'Now what's the matter?' demanded Samuel Salt, as Roger, sent to call the younger voyager, came flying back to the table. "'He says I may serve his dinner in the cabin,' snickered Roger, popping a biscuit into his mouth and swallowing it whole. "'Well, don't you do it!' roared the captain, bringing his fist down with an angry thump. "'No use to start such nonsense!' But he's so thin and feeble. The poor child's just full of raw roots and jungle grass," murmured Ato, beginning to heap a platter with meat and vegetables. Wait till he folds himself round some of these seafaring rations. He'll be a different person. And he'd better be," rumbled the captain of the Crescent Moon, pulling in his chair. And if you and Roger want to spoil the little pest, go ahead. But he'd better keep out of my way. Ha! I could drop the dinner on his head," suggested Roger helpfully, as Ato handed him an appetizing tray for Tandy. How would that be? Utterly reprehensible, and conduct unbecoming in a royal reed-bird and able-bodied seaman," chuckled the ship's cook, shaking his finger at Roger. Why don't you try to help the little beggar and set him a good example? 
Now Roger, in spite of his sharp tongue, was really a sociable and kind-hearted bird, and the sight of Tandy sitting so forlornly on his bunk made him regret his teasing speeches. After all, the little fellow was far from home and had a hard time in the jungle. Here, he puffed, setting down the tray and lighting the lantern. This'll put feathers on your chest, young one, and mind you eat every scrap. Thank you, answered Tandy, so drearily that Roger, with a shudder of distaste, fled back to the cheerful company of Samuel and Ato. But later, when Samuel had gone below to pot the precious plants from Patripany Island and the ship's cook was leaning over the rail conversing cozily with the hippopotamus, Roger flew back to Tandy's cabin, resolved to help him if he could. With calm satisfaction he noted that Tandy had eaten everything on the tray. Lying on his back, the young king of Ozamaland was staring solemnly up at the beams over his bunk. "'Ahoy! And what goes on here?' cried Roger, setting down on the old sea-chest. "'How about a turn on deck, my lad, and a bit of chatter with the crew?' It is not seemly for a king and son of a king's son to talk with his inferiors," observed Tandy coldly. "'Inferiors!' screamed Roger, forgetting all his good intentions and mad enough to nip the youngster's nose right off. "'Are you by any chance referring to me?' "'Ozamaland is a great and powerful country, and I am its king,' stated Tandy, turning his back on the reed-bird. At this Roger let out another screech, and then suddenly remembering the purpose of his visit, took a long breath to steady himself. When he spoke again, his voice was both calm and reasonable. Oh, Zamalan may be a great and powerful country, and you may also be its king. But remember, you are no longer in Ozamaland," explained Roger firmly. You are on this ship by the express wish and kindness of the captain and in company of kings and better. Wait!" Shaking a claw at Tandy's back, Roger flew off to fetch one of Ato's books from the shelf above the stove. Tandy was in the same position when he returned, but paying him no further attention, Roger pulled the lamp nearer and opened his volume. "'When a king is in the company of kings,' began the reed-bird impressively. He is no longer a special or royal being, but merely a man among men, and as such must maintain his honour and standing by sheer worth and ability alone." "'Who says that? What are you reading?' Tandy sat up with sudden interest, for his whole life had been spent in study and reflection, and the voice of the reed-bird was not unlike the voice of Wujibigudja his royal instructor at home. "'I am reading Maxims for Monarchs,' answered Roger calmly. "'A book of great authority and antiquity, that has been used by the rulers of Oz and Ev and the Nonstick Islands these many thousand years. No great and important country would think of being without a copy of this book,' he continued severely. "'Strange, then, that I should not have heard of it,' mused Tandy looking not quite so sure of himself. "'We have no maxims for monarchs in Ozamaland.' "'Pooh, Ozamaland!' Roger dismissed the whole country with a shrug of his wing. "'A country as young and unimportant as that would probably know nothing about such matters.' "'You mean my country is not so old nor important as Oz and this two-penny island of your fat master?' shouted Tandy angrily. Of course not! Why, it's not even been discovered, and whoever has been there?" demanded Roger disdainfully. "'Take you, as its king, acting in this small up-country fashion, what can a fellow think? Here!' Shoving the book toward the disagreeable young monarch, the reed-bird urged him to look for himself. With a puzzled frown, Tandy re-read the passage Roger had just quoted. Well. Even though your master is a king, you're not a king, and neither is Samuel Salt," said Tandy, looking at Roger with some of his former arrogance. "'Oh, isn't he? Well, just lay to this young fellow,' Roger shook his claw under Tandy's upturned nose. 
Samuel Salt is captain of this ship, a knight and the royal discoverer of Oz, which makes him seventy times as important as you, King Pins. He not only is boss of the Crescent Moon, but he rules the sea, discovering countries for other kings to govern, and if it were not for Samuel Salt and the people like him, there wouldn't be any kingdoms nor people like you to run them. See? As for me, I'm a royal reed-bird, and wouldn't be a king for a minute. I can live my own life and go and come as I please." "'Then, while I'm on this ship, I'm not a king at all,' said Tandy wonderingly. "'Then what am I? What am I supposed to do?' The little boy looked puzzled and positively frightened. "'Why, you're supposed to act like a person, that is, if possible.' sniffed Roger, reaching over for his book and looking at Tandy sideways down his bill. "'What are you besides a king? What can you do that is useful or interesting?' "'Do! Do!' Tandy's voice rose shrilly. "'Why, er, uh, why, I can draw pictures and ride an elephant!' "'Good!' Roger put his call up to hide the grin that, in spite of his best efforts, began to spread round his bill. "'Well, there isn't much call for drawing or elephant-riding on a ship, but you can draw water to swab the decks, and I'll teach you to ride the yards and follow the cross-trees to the main topgallant mast in the blowingest blow that ever blowed. And depend upon it, young one, you'll have more fun as a person than you ever had as a king. There's no place for having fun like a ship.' Fun," said Tandy flatly and inquiringly. "'What's that?' "'Tar and Tobacky Jack! What are you telling me?' Roger almost toppled off the sea-chest. "'Do you mean to sit there like a dumb image and tell me you've never had any fun? Never felt so bursting full of ginger and happiness you could sing or do a sailor's hornpipe?' "'It is not seemly,' began the boy in a staid voice. "'It is... "'Seem thee! Great goose-feathers! Are you alive or aren't you?' gasped Roger. "'What in paint did you do in that cussed country of yours before you got carried off and penned up like a pig in the jungle?' Considering Roger's question, Tandy clasped and unclasped his hands nervously. "'Well, you must know,' he began in a very grown-up voice, the king of Ozamaland is not allowed to mingle with the common people. In all things he is alone and set apart. So it was with my father and mother before they disappeared. So it is with me. Furthermore, it being prophecy that I would be carried off by an ant in the middle years of my youth, it was deemed expedient and necessary to keep me locked away from danger in the white tower of the wise men." "'A rump!' grunted the reed-bird who had not heard so many long words since the voyage began. "'And what did you do in this precious tower?' "'I studied,' sighed Tandy, reclining wearily back on his pillows. "'For there are many things a king must learn. But one hour of every evening I was permitted to walk about the garden on top of the tower and look down upon my kingdom. On very great occasions I was allowed to come out and ride the white elephant in the grand processions of state." "'Humph!' grunted Roger again, looking at Tandy with round, dismayed eyes. "'And with whom did you play?' he asked after a little silence. "'Play?' Again Tandy's voice was politely inquiring. "'The word was play,' insisted the reed-bird doggedly. "'With whom did you run about?' play tag, checkers, pirates, or go fishing." Tandy looked confused and Roger shook his head sorrowfully. "'Never heard of such things!' he exclaimed indignantly. "'Well, all I can say is, whoever carried you off and shut you up in that jungle cage did you a real service. If you had not been there we never would have found you, and I'm here to tell you that from now on things are going to be different. You're discovered now, and aboard the grandest ship afloat. You can forget all about being a king and start right in being a person and an able-bodied seaman. I, for my part, mean to see you have some fun or break a wing in the attempt." "'But would a king—' "'King! 
Never let me hear that terrible word again," shuddered Roger, sticking his head under his wing and then popping it comically out again. "'From now on you're plain Tandy, and you can do as you plain please so long as it does no harm to yourself or the ship. Understand? And tomorrow we'll start having fun, so be ready!' Roger's promise sounded almost like a threat. But there was such a merry twinkle in his eye, Tandy began to feel interested. You might even begin tonight," sniffed Roger, taking up the tray. Just begin by thinking of something you want to do. Think about it hard and then do it. Winking cheerfully over the empty plates, the reed bird spread his wings and sailed through the port. For several minutes Tandy lay where he was, turning Roger's last injunction over and over in his stiff, precise little mind. What did he really want to do? At first he could think of nothing. Then suddenly he knew. Why, of course, he wanted to talk to Kobo and he just plain would. There was a frosted cake left from his supper and slipping it into his blouse, Tandy stepped quietly out on deck. The ship, with only a slight roll, was moving briskly through the water, white foam falling in lacy spray from her sides, the moon-white sails spread like giant wings above his head. There was no one in sight, and, almost holding his breath, Tandy tiptoed aft and leaned adventurously over the taffrail. "'Kobo! Yo! Kobo!' he called huskily. "'Hello! I thought you'd be out soon!' Swinging round and turning her vast smile upward, the hippopotamus gazed fondly at her young charge. "'Are you comfortable? Did you have a good dinner?' she asked anxiously. "'Yes, and look what I saved for you!' As he spoke, Tandy glanced over his shoulder as if he were almost afraid to have anyone see him enjoying himself. "'Open your mouth, Kobo!' he whispered eagerly. Without hesitation or question, the hippopotamus stretched her jaws wide and Tandy, with the first real thrill of his life, flung the frosted cake into that immense pink cavern. As Kobo neatly caught and snapped her lips on the tempting morsel, Tandy let out a faint cheer and began to think there might be something in Roger's suggestions after all. "'I'll throw you lots of things tomorrow,' he promised gaily. "'Good night, Kobo. Good night, Kobo, dear!' Humming a tuneless little song, the young king hurried almost cheerfully back to his cabin. Pausing in the doorway of his tidy quarters, he looked about complacently. What did he want to do next? There was no one to tell him to go to bed, so he just plain wouldn't. He'd sit up as late as he plain pleased. Rummaging through Peter's sea-chest, which Ato had placed near the bunk, Tandy found a large tablet of stiff paper, a box of paints and some crayons. Settling himself cross-legged on his bunk, he began drawing, not pictures of castles and courtiers of Ozamaland, but pictures of the queer jungle beasts and leopard men he had seen on Patrippany Island. When Roger, on first watch, called out eight bells, he saw Tandy's light still burning, and flying down to investigate, found his new pupil fast asleep in the middle of his masterpieces. The whole bunk was covered with bright drawings and pictures, and even to Roger's inexperienced eye they seemed excellently done. So, carefully, the reed-bird stowed them in the sea-chest, then, without bothering to waken or undress the little king, he covered him with a light blanket and went quietly from the cabin. End of chapter 8「Of Captain Salt in Oz – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Captain Salt in Oz by Ruth Plumley Thompson Chapter 9 Sea Legs for Tandy If what Roger tells us is so, little Saucebox yonder has had a pretty dull life," said Ato as he and the captain sat finishing the breakfast next morning. "'Lucky for him we happened along, and anyway the hippopotamus will be good company, eh, Samuel? 
He seems downright sensible and jolly. Reminds me of Pigasus, and I suppose she does belong to the pig family when you come to think of it. Well, she's a pretty big pig if she does, laughed Samuel Salt, swallowing his coffee with gusty relish. Pretty big any way you take her. Personally, I like the animal, but the king and son of a king's son, pah! Reminds me of Peter, he's so different, and the sooner we Rachel Zamaland and set him ashore, the better. Meals in his own cabin, ho! Oh. oh, give him time, drawled Ato, helping himself a second time to fried potatoes. If there's any good in the lad, a sea voyage will bring it out, and what chance has he had shut up in a tower for ten years and in a cage for five months? Though how an ant managed to have him carried so far, and why she left him with those savages in the jungle, I can't get through my head at all." "'Maybe it was a giant,' whistled Roger, swooping down on Ado's plump shoulder and flapping his wings cheerfully. "'How far do you figure it is to a Zamaland, Master Salt?' "'Well, that I couldn't say,' answered Samuel in a milder voice. Pushing back his chair, he stepped over to the map on the west wall. "'Maybe a thousand leagues or so from Petripany Island, maybe more, in a line east by southeast from Ev. If that is so, we're bound to bump into it some time, as I've set my course east by southeast, and anyway it's all in a year's sailing.' Samuel bent over with pride to examine the newest island discovery he had marked on the chart the evening before. "'And when we do come to it,' he announced firmly, "'we'll trade this useless young one for some of those flying snakes and creeping birds, eh, mates?' "'If we bring any more animals aboard, we might as well set up an ark and be done with it,' warned Ato, shaking his fork at the captain. "'By the way, how's Sally this morning?' Tip top sails, grinned Samuel. She eats nothing but hot air and water and is no more trouble than a hair in a flea's whisker. I can carry her round in my pipe when I want company. Now there's a lass for you. Well, I'll just see to Nicobo, for she's the girl for me, retorted Ato, rolling briskly out of his seat. I saved all the potato peelings from last night and that, with a dozen cans of peas, corn, carrots, and beets, should stay her appetite till lunchtime. Forty cans at one swallow,' groaned Roger, clapping a claw to his head in mock dismay. "'She'll eat us out of ship and home at this rate. Can't you think of something else, King dear? A nice wind pudding or a tub of sea-soup sprinkled with faggots?' "'Oh, go along with you,' roared Ato and picking up his precious coffee-pot he waddled cheerfully off to his storeroom. The day was bright and breezy, and the crescent moon going free, breasted the waves like a white-winged sea-witch. It was such a morning that even Tandy, peering inquiringly from his cabin, felt an uncontrollable impulse to slide down the deck. So he did, coming up smartly by Roger, who was perched on the rail. "'That's it! That's it!' Now you're catching on," approved the reed bird, hopping cheerfully from one foot to the other. Now match your step to the sea's roll, Sonny. Get into her rhythm. You've got to breathe with the ship to carry your rations on a voyage. Watch the captain there and do as he does," finished Roger as Samuel Salt left his cabin and came striding aft. Rather watch you," exclaimed Tandy, who sensed the captain's dislike. Uneasily, he moved a little nearer the reed bird. All right, come on then, shouted Roger, heading recklessly for the foremast. Ever climb a tree? Tandy shook his head, looking with deep misgiving into the maze of sail and rigging above. But Roger was already aloft and beckoning for him to follow. Not that way, brainless, scolded Roger anxiously as Tandy, gritting his teeth, made a desperate leap upward. See those rope ladders by the rail? Put your feet in the ratlines, boy, and come along hand over hand. It's easy as flying once you get the swing of it. There, that's better. Come on, come on, don't stop, don't look down." So up, up, and up the narrow rope ladders toiled Tandy, till Roger, growing impatient, 
seized his collar and helped him straddle the cross-tree of the fort to gallant mast. Ahoy! And isn't this better than riding an elephant? beamed Roger, winking a knowing eye. Ahoy! This is fun, and no fooling! Seeing Tandy was too dizzy and breathless to talk for a moment, Roger cheerfully set himself to teach the young Ozamander a bit about ships and sailing. Soon Tandy was so interested he forgot the leap and plunge of the ship, the rattle and creak of the cordage, and his own precarious perch in the foremast. "'The crescent moon,' began Roger, with an impressive jerk of his head, "'is a square-rigged, three-masted sailing-vessel. Normally twould take from sixty to eighty men in a crew to set and make sail and bring her about in a blow. But Samuel Salt has magic sail-controls, so we three manage quite easily, and now that you are here, and the handy hippopotamus below, twill be easier still. The mast we're riding is the foremast. The second mast from the bow, as we call the front of the ship, is the mainmast. And the mast at the back, or as we saltwater birds say, the stern of the boat, is the mizzenmast. And now for the sails. Roger took a deep breath. Those below, beginning from the bottom up, are the course, the topsail, the top gallant sail, the royal, and the sky sail. And don't forget, Roger wagged his claw sternly, before each sail you must put the name of the mast to which it is attached. As, for instance, this ahead of us is the foretop gallant sail, see? And everything to the left of the ship's center we say is on the port side, and anything to the right is on the starboard. Then tell me why is the water on the port side bluer than the water on the starboard? asked Tandy, who had been listening very solemnly as he tried to fix all of these strange sea terms in his head. Bravo! cried Roger. Right the first time, mate! and the water is bluer on the port side of the vessel because it is saltier. The bluer, the saltier," declared Roger, who, besides his first voyage with the crescent moon, had read all the sea-books in Ato's library and was simply crammed with deep-sea facts and information. "'And what is more,' he continued, pursing his bill mysteriously, "'we're sailing in a magic circle never knowing what may pop up over the edge. A ship? An island? a hurricane? Or even a fabulous monster? That's what makes sea-voyaging so glorious and sailing so much fun!" Tandy, staring at the empty circle of blue falling away from the ship on all sides, nodded dreamily. The White City, Patrippany Island, all his former life and existence seemed unreal and far away and he hoped in his heart of hearts the crescent moon would not reach his native shores for many a long gay day. As Roger said, being a person was fun. Mmm, Roger sniffed suddenly. Wonder what Ato's cooking. Smells like taffy. I'll bet a ship's biscuit we're going to have a candy pull. A candy pull, exclaimed Tandy, taking a furious sniff himself. What is that?" As Roger started in to explain about candy poles, a large green column shot up on the skyline, a column so surprising and shocking in appearance that Tandy felt positively stunned. "'Oh, look! Look!' he screamed, grabbing Roger's wing. "'There's something now! Oh, Roger, what fun! What terrible fun!' "'Fun?' Roger spun round like a weathercock in a gale. Fun? he repeated, stretching out his neck as far as it would go and a few inches besides. Oh, my best bill and feathers! That's not fun, that's a sea serpent! Help! Help! Deck ahoy! Hoy! Hoy! Below! King! Captain! Ato! Sammy! Samuel! as if calling them not only by their titles, but by their names would increase the number of the ship's officers and crew, Roger tugged wildly at Tandy's arm. "'Below! Below! All hands below!' shrilled the reed-bird. "'Cover all ports and batten the hatches!' Urged on by Roger, Tandy, still more interested than frightened, descended rapidly to the main deck. At Roger's cries, Ato had run out with a pan of bubbling molasses in one hand and his trusty bread-knife in the other. 
Right behind him stood Samuel Salt, his eye pressed to his largest spyglass. "'Well, tar in tarry barrels!' exclaimed the captain exultantly. "'Why, this is a sea-serpent second to none, the finest example of a marine ophidian I've ever met in all my voyages!' "'Oh, fiddlesticks!' blustered Ato, shaking him angrily by the arm. Are you a captain or a collector? Quick now, make up your mind before your ship is crunched down like a cracker and we're all swallowed up with the crumbs. Quick, Sammy, for the love of salt mackerel, do something!" Squeezing himself between the cook and the captain, Tandy saw that there were now three immense shiny curves showing above the water, and with scarcely a splash the tremendous monster was moving toward the ship. Then suddenly it was upon them and its huge, horrid, unbelievable head came curling far over the bow of the crescent moon. "'Avast and belay! Avast and belay, you villain!' yelled Samuel Salt, dropping his spyglass and grasping his blunderbuss, while Roger beat his wings together like castanets and screamed like a fire-siren. Tandy, rather frightened himself, and not knowing what else to do, fell flat on his stomach, and pulling a pad from his blouse, began making a quick and frantic sketch of the dreadful sea-beast. Its body was leagues long and yards through, the head was large as a whole elephant, with a long curling silver tongue and darting green fangs. But it was the teeth that made even the stout heart of Ato hammer against his ribs. Each tooth of this singular sea-serpent was a live white goblin, brandishing a long spear. Leaning far out of the yawning mouth, they screamed, hissed, and yelled at the defenseless company below. The next forward thrust of the monster brought its head curling right down among them. This so startled Tandy, he could neither move nor scream. Samuel fired his blunderbuss so fast and furiously it sounded like a dozen guns, but it was Ato who really saved the day and his shipmates. With calm and deadly precision, the ship's cook flung the pan of still bubbling molasses straight into the cavernous mouth. Screaming with surprise, pain, and fury, the monster clamped its jaws together, and finding them stuck fast on the taffy, fell writhing back into the sea, dashing and slashing its head under water to ease the burn and setting the crescent moon to dancing like a cocklebur. But the taffy, hardened by contact with the cold water, stuck faster than ever and, unable to bite and scarcely able to breathe, the discomfited sea-monster backed away from the ship and went slithering and thrashing away toward the skyline. "'Well, there goes our candy-pull,' sighed Roger, falling in a limp heap to Ato's shoulder. "'Nice work, nice work, King Deer. There's a certain touch about your fighting that is well-nigh irresistible.' "'Mainsails and topsails!' You certainly pulled a trick that time," puffed Samuel Salt, picking up his spyglass to have a last look at his lovely specimen. You saved us and the ship that time, mate. My bullets rattled off its hide like hailstones off a roof. Pooh! Just happened to have the taffy handy," answered Ato, looking rather regretfully into the empty pot. Here, child, run back and tell Kobo everything's all right. The ship's cook pulled Tandy quickly to his feet. "'Just listen to her squealing. The poor lass is probably frightened out of her skin.' As Tandy started aft on a run, Ato picked up the sketch he had made of the monster. "'Ahoy, and what's this?' he panted. "'What did I tell you, Sammy? Look, the boy's drawn as lively a picture of that varmint as you'd ever hope to paste in a scrapbook. Here it is, tail, teeth, and everything.' Mean to say he drew that while we were all standing here ready to perish and go down with the ship? Ha! That's what I call bravery in action!" exclaimed Samuel. "'And goose-wing my topsails! If the young lubber can draw like this, he'll be a monstrous help to us mates. Why, I'll make him cabin-boy and royal artist of the expedition, with extra rations and pay!' "'Hooray! And I'll tell him!' puffed Roger, spreading his wings gleefully. Hi, King! Hi, Tandy! Ho, oh, Tandy! You've been promoted from King to Cabin Boy and Royal Drawer of Animals and Islands and Extra Rations and Pay!" Nicobo was as pleased as Tandy at her little charge's rise to favor, 
and after they had both listened in rapt silence to Roger's news, Tandy told her how Ato had routed the sea serpent. Meanwhile, Roger had carried all the sketches Tandy had made of the leopard men and Patripity Island to the main cabin. Samuel's delight and enthusiasm at having such spirited and authentic records of the lost tribe and strange animals on Patripany Island knew no bounds. He beamed on Tandy so kindly and approvingly next time they met, the little boy felt warm and jolly all the way down to his heels. Roger had already explained his new duties to him, and when Ado sounded the gong for dinner, Tandy was the first to answer. But when he started to pass the vegetables and wait on the table, the captain gruffly pushed him into a chair. "'All equals here!' roared Samuel, slapping him affectionately on the shoulder. "'You've earned your place and your salt, Sonny, and we'll all help ourselves and each other.' Tilting back his chair and keeping time with his teacup, Samuel began to sing lustily, "'Blow high, blow low, tis a salt sea life for me. Where the good ship's crew I'll sail the blue, where the good ship go in free, where the good ship go in free.' Almost before he knew it, Tandy was singing too. End of chapter 9「Ten of Captain Salt in Oz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Captain Salt in Oz by Ruth Plumley Thompson. Chapter Ten The City of Bridges. The days that followed always seemed to Tandy the happiest he had known. He wondered now how he had ever endured his long, tedious, pent-up life in Ozamaland. There was so much to see and do on a ship, the hours were not half long enough. Being a full-fledged member of the crew, he took his turn on watch, his trick at the wheel, and had, besides, other duties on deck. After a bit of practice, he could scramble aloft like a monkey and liked nothing so much as perching in the rigging looking far out to sea. The reed-bird had fastened a special rope to the mizzenmast, so that Tandy could swing out and drop down on Nicobo's raft, and much of his free time was spent with the faithful hippopotamus. Sea-life agreed enormously with Nicobo, especially since Ato had solved the largest item of her diet. Noting the tangled mass of seaweed often floating by on the surface of the sea, the clever cook let down the ship's nets daily. The seaweed, crisp, tender, and green, was dragged on deck where Roger and Tandy went carefully through it, removing all crabs, small fish, and seashells, which seriously disagreed with the hippopotamus. A huge hamperful was lowered to her every evening, and with this plentiful supply of green food, with the bread and delicious vegetable scraps Ato saved from the table, Nicobo fared better than she had on the island. The largest tub on the boat served as a drinking cup, and this Tandy kept full by playing down the hose from the deck, giving her a daily shower of fresh water at the same time. So, lacking nothing in interest or comfort, Nicobo enjoyed herself hugely and to the fullest extent. On calm mornings, with the crescent moon hove too, all hands would go swimming. Nicobo loved to swim and to roll over and over like a mighty porpoise, even though the salt water made her eyes sting. Since Tandy had given Samuel the drawings of the leopard men, the ship's captain could not do enough for his young cabin boy, and, among other things, had made up a rope harness for Nicobo, so Tandy could hang on when he perched upon her slippery back. At first he had been satisfied to ride Nicobo, but after several days he was splashing recklessly with the others and Samuel had taught him all the swimming strokes he knew, and had Tandy diving over and under the hippopotamus in a way to make Roger scream with envy and approval. Swimming was the only part of a sea voyage the reed bird could not really enjoy, but he was always on hand to give advice roosting on Nicobo's head so long as she stayed above water, and taking hurriedly to his wings when she mischievously tried to dunk him. The hippopotamus made a really splendid raft when they tired of swimming, 
and Ato, who did not care for water sports so much as Samuel or Tandy, fish for hours from her back, his feet hooked through the ropes of her harness to keep him from falling into the sea. The only thing Tandy regretted was Nikobo's great size, and that she could not come aboard ship and join them in the cabin. On cool evenings he and Ato and the captain, Roger preferring to take first watch, would sit cosily round the fire listening to the story Samuel told them of the days when he had been a pirate, and roamed up and down the nonstick capturing the ships and treasure of all the powerful island monarchs. Tandy never tired of these thrilling sea battles, nor of watching Samuel Salt's pet fire lizard. Sally was now so tame she would allow any one of them to pick her up. They had to be careful not to hold her against their clothing, however, for though Sally did not burn the fingers, she set fire to whatever she touched. Indeed, whenever they wanted a fire in the grate, they had only to place the salamander on the kindlings beneath the logs, and a cheery flame would blaze up instantly. It was in the fireplace Sally took most of her exercise, racing and skittering over the glowing logs or rolling happily in the red-hot embers. But most of her time she spent curled up in Samuel Salt's pipe, and it was always a surprise to Tandy to see her comical head pop up over the edge of the bowl, or hear her chirping and purring to herself from her cosy bed of tobacco leaves. Some evenings, when Ada was trying out new recipes in the galley, Tandy and Samuel would descend to the hold to look over the plants from Patripany Island, try to figure out the script on the piece of lava, and sort and arrange Samuel's shell collection. Every day after the nets were drawn up there were new specimens to classify and label. The drawing Tandy had made of the sea lion and all the pictures of the leopard men and beasts on Patripany Island Samuel had framed and hung above his shelves, so that the hold was looking more and more like a scientific laboratory every day. "'Do you suppose we'll ever find anything large enough to put in those big cages and aquariums?' asked Tandy one night as he pasted a pink label on a fluted conch shell. "'Sure's eight bells,' murmured Samuel Salt comfortably. "'No telling what'll turn up on a voyage like this. Personally, I've set my heart on a rock's egg, but setting the heart on a rock's egg won't hatch one out. Ho, ho! No, no! But, on the other hand, one never can tell, and we've had a week of such fine and pleasant days. I look for something to happen any moment now. So you'd better put up your paste-pot and turn in, my lad, so we'll all be ready for the morning." "'Well, what would you do with a rock's egg?' inquired Tandy reluctantly clapping the top of his bottle of glue. "'Aren't they terribly big and terribly scarce, Captain Salt?' "'Terribly,' admitted Samuel Salt, placing his tray of lampshells back on their stand. "'But a newly laid rock's egg is as rare as a mermaid's foot, and no larger than one small tar-barrel. Now, if we could just get a newly laid rock's egg aboard and find some way to preserve it, why, well and good.' If we didn't find a way, and it hatched before we landed, it could easily fly off with us and the ship, for that's how big a bird a rock is. But I'll take a chance if I ever find a rock's egg, and there's an island somewhere in these waters where rocks are known to nest. Rock Island is called, and a rock's nest would be something to see, eh, Kinglet?" "'Please don't call me that,' begged Tandy earnestly. "'Roger says I don't have to be a king on this ship, and I like not being a king." "'Ha, ha! And I'd like you that way myself!' roared Samuel, tossing Tandy suddenly to his shoulder. "'Why, since you've stopped this king and son of a kinging, you're a seaman after my own heart, and so long as the crescent moon's afloat you've a berth on her. Up with you! Up with you! Tomorrow's another day!' Swinging gaily to the main deck, Samuel tumbled Tandy into his bunk, and went striding aft to take in his main and mizzen topsails. Next morning, while he and Ado were cutting up potatoes for Nicobo, Tandy was not surprised to hear a loud hail from above. Something had happened just as Samuel had predicted. Running out with a paring-knife still in his hand, he saw a strange glittering mountainous island abaft the beam. It was still a goodish sea-mile away, but with the glasses Ato generously pressed upon him, 
Tandy made out the most curious bit of geography the eyes of a voyager had yet gazed on. There was not a piece of level ground on the island anywhere. Its high, glittering, needle-like peaks rose straight out of the sea, with apparently no way of ascending or descending. Of clear crystal, reflecting every color of the rainbow, the beautiful island was almost too dazzling to look at as it lay shimmering and sparkling in the bright sunshine. As they sailed nearer, Tandy saw that a perfect maze of high and airy bridges ran like a gigantic spider-web between the peaks. On these bridges all the island's life and activity seemed to take place. Quaint, fluted cottages were built in the center, and along the perilous catwalks on either side raced the mountaineers themselves, brandishing glittering poles and spears and halberds. "'Pikes on the peak! Pikes on the peak! Port your helm, Sammy!' roared Ado. "'Not too close! Not too near, Samuel! How'd you like to be pinned to the mast with a spear, or flattened on the deck with a boulder?' "'Ah, now, they're just excited,' answered Samuel Salt, squinting curiously up at the bridgeman but Nicobo, with her short legs resting on the top rail of her raft, squealed out a dolorous warning. "'Fighters! Fighters! These pikers look savager than the leopard men! Best back away, Master Captain, while there's still time!' "'Oh, look! Look! There's a ship on the mountain!' cried Tandy, jerking Samuel's sleeve. "'Right there, where that torrent comes down between the bridges! A three-master! larger than the crescent moon. "'Then it's a battle,' boomed Samuel, bringing his helm hard around. "'Stand by to man the guns! Hoy! All hands, hoy!' While his shipmates sprang to attention, Samuel darted from mast to mast, touching the buttons on his sail controls. "'Aye, aye, ole!' The shrill, unexpected cry came from the highest bridge on the island, and was immediately taken up and repeated by all the pikemen on the lower bridges. It resulted in such a mad medley of yodels that Ado clapped both hands to his ears, and Nicobo plunged her head in her drinking-tub. "'Not only fighters, but singers,' grunted Ado, swinging the port-gun into an upright position. "'Beef, beans, and barley bread! What a rumpus!' Tandy, who with Roger had charge of the other gun, could not help but admire the calm way Samuel Salt ignored the dreadful outcry from the bridges. Whether the pikes of the islanders could be flung down upon them was still a question, but as Tandy looked anxiously aloft he saw the great white-sailed ship of the mountain men sweeping toward the torrent. It paused for a breathless instant on the top and then came rushing down upon them they were right in the path of the descending vessel, which would strike them with such force both ships would surely be demolished. "'I am a king's son, and the son of a king's son,' shuddered Tandy, gritting his teeth and waiting desperately for the order to fire. "'I can bear anything.' "'Not this! Not this!' shattered Roger, sliding wildly up and down the shiny cannon. "'It will shiver your timbers!' It will shiver all our timbers. What insult ails the captain? Why doesn't he give the order to fire and pepper these rascals before they reach us? Oh, oh, oh!" But the only orders that came from the captain were for Nicobo. "'Overboard, lassie! Dive off! Quick now, and swim for your life!' bawled Samuel Salt, waving both arms frantically at the hippopotamus. As Nicobo, with a frightened squeal, let down the back rail of her pen and slid into the sea, Tandy felt a quiver and jerk through the whole length of the crescent moon. Glancing aloft, he saw a strange change in the sails. Where before they had been sturdy single stretches of canvas, they were now great swelling balloon sails, each a perfect air-filled sphere. As the ship from the mountain with an angry swish catapulted down from the torrent into the sea, the crescent moon rose buoyantly into the air, allowing the enemy craft to shoot harmlessly beneath her bow. "'What in Monday!' gasped Ato, flinging both arms round the cannon. "'What in Monday are you up to now? How'd we do this? 
Stop! Stop! I'm no flyer! No higher! No higher! Do you intend to impale us on yonder peaks?' Samuel Salt, hanging desperately to the wheel, made no reply, and as the ship, dipping and swaying, soared higher and higher, the deafening yodels of the bridgemen ceased abruptly. "'Wah! Wah! Where are you heading?' demanded Roger, spreading his wings in order to keep his balance on the sloping deck. "'You never told us you had balloon sails, Master Salt.' "'Ahoy! But we never needed them before,' panted Samuel. "'Look sharp below, Roger. Tell me whether I'm over that lake or basin. Look sharp, mind you, or we'll come to grief yet.' "'Aye, aye,' quavered the reed-bird, dropping obediently over the side. "'It all looks sharp to me.' "'Mean to say you're coming down in the middle of these pikes, peaks, and bridges?' moaned Ato, holding his head with both hands. "'A vast and belay, mate. I signed up for a sea voyage, and not a balloon ride. The altitude's got you, Sammy, that's what. You've air-holes in your head. How do you expect the four of us to conquer this whole pesky peaky island? How could we even take half of them?' "'By surprise!' announced Samuel Salt grimly. "'We'll take em by surprise. Look, they're too surprised to even yodel. Fetch up the Oz flags, Tandy, and all hands aft for further orders.' "'Aft and daft,' choked Ato, hanging on to the rail as he made his way toward the wheel. When Tandy came hurrying up from the hold, his arms full of Oz flags, the crescent moon hung directly over the glittering island. Roger fluttered anxiously just below, calling up hoarse information as to the size, possible depth and shape of the sparkling blue lake between the peaks. Listening carefully to Roger's directions, Samuel deflated his balloon sail so skillfully the crescent moon came down lightly as a swan in the exact center of the lake. Above and around the ship on all sides hung the glittering spans of a beautiful bridge city and in stunned silence and dismay the bridgeman looked down on the flying ship and its curious crew. "'Ahoy and hail, men of the mountain!' challenged Samuel in a ringing voice. "'You are now part and parcel of the great kingdom of Oz, free as before to govern yourselves, but from this day and henceforth on an island possession and colony under the protection and puissant rule of Her Majesty Queen Ozma of Oz. Oz? Ose Oz Ole? The cry came from the tallest and most splendid of the islanders, who was standing with folded arms on the lacy span connecting the two highest peaks on the mountain. End of chapter 10《Chapter Eleven of Captain Salt in Oz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Captain Salt in Oz by Ruth Plumley Thompson. Chapter Eleven The Prince of the Peaks. The cry, though loud, was no longer defiant, and Tandy, with a little gasp of relief, saw the mountaineers on all the bridges bring their pikes to rest beside them and gaze aloft for further orders. "'I am Alberif, Prince of the Peaks,' stated the man on the highest bridge, looking coolly down at Samuel Salt. "'But you, you who come in this flying ship to conquer the island of Peak and Spire, who are you?' Ato, the Eighth, King of the Octagon Isles, Sir Samuel Salt, Captain of the Crescent Moon and Royal Explorer of Oz, Tazander Taza, King of Ozamaland, and myself a Royal Reed Bird, shouted Roger before any of the others had time to speak for themselves. The Prince of the Peaks, tall and splendid in his shining coat and breeches of silver cloth, his broad-brimmed hat with its quill and rosette of wild flowers, looked so much more impressive than anyone aboard the Crescent Moon, Tandy half expected him to laugh at Roger's boastful announcements. But instead, 
Alberneef, leaning far out over his royal bridge, looked down at them long and seriously. Two kings, a royal discoverer, a flying ship, and a reed-bird! Hi de i do ho whistled the handsome monarch, shaking his head ruefully. No wonder we were captured! What, then, are your terms, kings, captain, bird, and conquerors?" "'Not conquerors, comrades,' called up Samuel Salt in his hearty voice. "'Only by your own wish, agreement and consent, shall ye come under the rule of Oz. If your highness could but descend from yon royal bridge to this ship, everything can be arranged both peaceably and pleasantly.' "'Where, Alberif, where, Alberif? yodeled the pikemen on the lower bridges. "'Once aboard that ship, yep, we may never see you again, yen. "'Oh, nonsense!' blustered Samuel Salt impatiently. "'I give you my word as a pirate and a seaman. No harm shall come to you on the crescent moon.' The prince stood lost in thought for a moment. Then, tapping his long alpenstick sharply, he issued a high yodeled command. From the bridgehead an immense basket swooped down. The prince seated himself gravely in the basket, and with three men manipulating the ropes made a swift and dizzy descent to the deck of the crescent moon. While Samuel and Roger welcomed the tall and lordly ruler of the mountain isle, Ato hurried off to the galley to prepare some suitable refreshments for his entertainment. Tandy, after Samuel had introduced him, began making careful sketches of the handsome prince, of the lovely city of bridges and of the pikemen, who still looked with suspicion and distrust upon the ship that had taken the place of their own. "'How about that basket?' whispered Roger, who had come out to help Ato in the galley. "'How'd you like to be hoisted and lowered like a sail? And for salt's sake, King dear, Dust the flower off your nose and put on your crown, or this fellow will think you're king of the cookies and doughnuts. Ha ha! When he's tasted my plum cake, he'll not think it, he'll know it, puffed Ato, bustling happily from cupboard to cupboard. Bring out the best tumblers and silver plates, fetch up a dozen bottles of my famous sea pop from the hold, and we'll have this island in our pocket before you can say Oz Robinson. When Adol with one tray and Roger with another came out, they found the captain and the prince of the peaks striding up and down the deck in the friendliest conversation imaginable. Matched in height and handsomeness, the two were discussing with lively interest everything from ships and governments to the strange limestone that formed the crystalline rocks of Alberif's island. Later, seated around the table with Tandy and Roger passing plum cake and sea pop, the prince grew friendlier and more confidential still. "'We've never been conquered before,' admitted His Majesty with a puzzled smile. "'But really, I find it both interesting and enjoyable.' "'Just a matter of chance and luck,' said Samuel Salt, with a modest wave of his hand. "'Had I not had balloon sails on the crescent moon, your ship would have cut us clean in two before we had time to put about.' That is what I always planned would happen to an enemy craft," sighed Alberif. Naturally, our own ship, the Mountain Lass, would have been destroyed too, but we could easily have built another. That is what we'll have to do anyway, as we'll never be able to haul her up to the torrent. "'Don't you do it,' begged Samuel Salt, looking earnestly at the Mountain Monarch. I'll send you a set of balloon sails as soon as I reach Elbow Island. The Red Jean presented me with two sets, and I'll be delighted to send you one. Once we're set, you can fly up as easily as we did, and be ready for all and sundry, even us, if we come again." "'Come and welcome,' beamed Alberif, looking in some surprise at Sally, who had just lifted her head above the rim of Samuel's pipe-bowl. "'But tell me. What am I to do now that I am conquered? Surely something is required of us." "'Nothing, nothing at all,' Samuel spoke earnestly and admiringly. "'This island and your men are in fine shape and a great credit to you, so just go on as you are. 
but from this time forth you'll be in contact with the famous and most modern fairyland in history, and if you are ever beset by enemies you can call upon Oz for assistance or help. In time, fruit, foodstuffs, books and merchandise will arrive from Oz, and in return you may send back some of the sparkling crystals composing these mountains. You might even invite a band of settlers from Oz to come and live as your loyal subjects here." "'Gladly, gladly,' agreed the prince, his eyes sparkling at the prospect. "'We have many uninhabited peaks and spires, and could easily accommodate a thousand new bridge-builders. Come with me, all of you, to Skytop Tower, and we'll run up the flag of Oz and sign the Pledge of Allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Ozma. I de I o lay. Running out on deck, Albereth joyously beckoned to the men who operated the traveling basket, inviting them all to enter. Ato, who had no intention of trusting his two hundred and fifty pounds to this strange conveyance, shook the prince regretfully by the hand. I'll just watch it all from here, said the ship's cook firmly. I've pie to cook potatoes to peel and dinner to stir up for all hands, and a hippopotamus, so if you'll kindly excuse me." The prince looked a little disappointed, but cheered up as Samuel, Roger, and Tandy followed him into the basket. "'Haul away!' yelled Samuel Salt, winking at Ato, and to the shrill tune of a ringing round of yodels their curious elevator rose from the deck, spun merrily up to the Twin Peaks, and highest bridge of Alberif's mountain. Used as he was to the tall masts and lofty rigging of the crescent moon, Tandy felt sick and giddy as the basket swooped and swung upward. But it came down safely at last, and at sight of the shining spans of the lacy city spread out below, and the glittering castle rising from the royal bridge, Tandy forgot all his uneasiness. With a little whistle of surprise and interest, he followed Samuel and Albereth into the royal dwelling, while Roger flew off on a little exploring expedition of his own. Roger knew all about castles, and was much more interested in the many windowed, fluted cottages of the yodelers. Ato, watching from the deck of the crescent moon, presently saw the flag of Oz fluttering from the top turret of the castle tower, and with a little sigh of relief and pride he gathered up the empty pot-bottles and pattered off to his galley. Soon Oz flags floated from the posts on all the bridgeheads, adding much to the gaiety and beauty of Alberif City. From the royal bridge Tandy and Samuel had a splendid view, and of his many experiences Tandy always remembered best the afternoon spent on Pekinspire. Alberif was a merry as well as an interesting host, explaining everything from the strange traveling baskets to the age-old customs and treasures of the islanders. In the baskets the islanders could travel from bridge to bridge, and down to the sea itself when they wished to go fishing. There was little soil between the rocks, but such soil as there was was so amazingly fertile each family could raise all the fruit and vegetables required in one small window-box. After long experimentation and culture, Alberif's ancestors had perfected two curious vines. On one vegetables grew in rapid rotation, potatoes following peas, corn following potatoes, carrots following corn, beets following carrots, cabbages, lima beans, and spinach after the beets. The vine never withered or died, and by cutting off the top every day the islanders were assured of a continuous supply of fresh vegetables. The fruit vine was of the same variety, furnishing every known berry, fruit, and melon. Each family was given two of these vines, and thus had very little worry about food supplies. Birds, something of a cross between wild ducks and chickens, made their nests in the craggy peaks, and with their eggs and a plentiful supply of fish and other seafood the islanders fared splendidly. The bridge-men were tall, blue-eyed, handsome, and happy. Men and women alike wore short trousers and blouses of silver cloth, and carried pikes that served both as weapons and alpenstocks. The bridges, while delicate as fine lace in construction, were supple and strong as steel. 
The material mined from the mountains themselves was like silver and crystal combined, a new strong and glittering metal, samples of which Samuel happily thrust into his pocket. "'Sounds like magic,' said Tandy, who had been listening closely to Alberif's description of life on Peakinspire. "'It is a magic of a kind,' answered the prince with a pleased little nod and the air here is so light and sparkling we never tire, grow old, or have illness of any kind, so that my people are always light-hearted and happy, spending most of their time in dancing and singing." "'I see,' murmured Samuel Salt. "'Er, and here,' he added quickly as the wild, joyous cries of Alberif's yodlers made every window in the palace rattle. I'll certainly make a note of all this and report Peak and Spire Island to Queen Ozma as the most interesting discovery of the voyage." "'I am highly honored," Alberif bowed stiffly. "'Highly honored. Hide de o Jumping into the air, the Prince of the Peaks kicked his heels together from sheer exuberance. "'Wait,' he told them cheerfully, "'and I'll get you some fruit and vegetable vines to take back with you.' Tandy and Samuel could not help grinning as Alberif rushed off. To tell the truth, there was something so light and exhilarating about the mountain air they found it difficult to walk calmly themselves. As the prince returned, Samuel felt a loud and uncontrollable yodel rising in his own throat, and seizing Tandy's arm he bade Alberif a hasty and hearty adieu. Bidding him keep a sharp lookout for the airships from Oz, and loaded down with crystals and vines, the two explorers climbed into the basket and were swung swiftly down to the deck of the crescent moon. Roger, flying under his own power and yodeling like a native, arrived soon after. With Oz flags flying from all bridges and the mountaineers calling out rousing and melodious farewells, Samuel inflated his balloon sails and the ship soared gracefully aloft circled the island three times and then dropped lightly down upon the surface of the sea. The mountain lass, in charge of Alberif's husky crew, lay just off shore and there she would have to stay till Samuel sent a set of balloon sails to lift her back to the lake among the peaks. Nikobo, who had been swimming anxiously round and round, gave a bellow of relief as she spied the crescent moon. "'I thought you'd been captured and destroyed.' wheezed the hippopotamus, scrambling hastily aboard her raft. "'Next time you fly off, take me aboard, or give me a balloon sail, too. I'm so full of salt water, I'm perfectly pickled, and somebody'll have to scrape the barnacles off my hide.' "'But we brought you a present,' called Tandy, leaning far over the taffrail. "'A vegetable vine that will keep you supplied with fresh vegetables as long as we're at sea.' C D I D O. Avast and belay, D I, barked Samuel Salt grimly. Let's get away from here. This is no way for able bodied seamen to talk. Rushing from wheel to mast, he quickly set his sail. Ahoy! Ahoy, D O I D O! he yodeled, then, very red in the face, he blew three shrill blasts on his foghorn, swung his ship about, and the crescent moon, with a spanking breeze on her quarter, went skimming away toward the southern skyline. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 of Captain Salt in Oz This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Captain Salt in Oz by Ruth Plumley Thompson Chapter 12 Fog The evening had blown up raw and cold, and after carrying an old tarpaulin down to cover Nikobo, Tandy had come shivering back to the main cabin. Samuel Salt had close-reefed his topsails and double-reefed his courses, adjusted his mechanical steering gear, and now sat beside the fire examining a heap of the glittering crystals from Alberif's island. 
Just sketch Peak and Spire Island on the chart. There where I've made the cross," he directed, looking up with an absent smile as the little boy came over to warm himself at the cheerful blaze. You're such a hand with a brush, even in so small a place you can give a good idea of the city of bridges." "'And a good idea they are,' murmured Ato, who was busy mending his fishing nets on the other side of the fireplace. "'In every port we learn something new, eh, mate? All mountains, no matter how high and peaked, could be lived on if they were properly bridged.' "'True, quite true,' agreed Samuel squinting contentedly through his magnifying glass, while Tandy began sketching in the latest discovery on the sea-chart. "'I have written it all up in my journal, and put down Peak and Spire Island as able to accommodate a thousand settlers from Oz and as an especially good place for poets.' "'Provided they are deaf,' put in Ato, looking comically over his specs. "'I de I de o oh. While you fellows were aloft, I got to yodeling so fast and furious I blew all the saucepans off their hooks." "'Yes, that is one disadvantage,' admitted Samuel, glancing approvingly at Tandy's picture of Alberiff's Island. "'But never mind. We don't have to live there, and think of the splendid specimens we brought away, mates.' Samuel ran his fingers lovingly through the heap of crystals and strands of metal Alberiff had given him and those fruit and vegetable vines will provision us for the whole voyage." "'They're a great comfort to me, I assure you,' muttered Ato, holding up his net to the light to see whether there were any more holes. "'Now I know Kobo will never starve. I put a vegetable vine in a box on her raft, and that leaves two for us, two for Ozma, and maybe Tandy would like to take the other two home with him.' "'Home?' Tandy swung round in positive dismay. "'Oh, we're not near Ozamaland yet, are we, Captain?' His voice sounded so dismal, Samuel Saul threw down his magnifying glass with a roar of merriment. "'Shiver me timbers, lad! One would think you did not wish to reach Ozamaland at all!' he blustered teasingly. "'What's the matter with that country of yours? You wouldn't keep an honest explorer from adding a creeping bird and a flying reptile to his collection, now would you?" "'No, no, of course not,' answered Tandy quickly. "'But perhaps it is farther away than you think, Master Salt, and perhaps the Greys have conquered the Whites, and then I won't be king any more.' "'What's this? What's this?' Ato lifted his nose like an old hound that has just scented a fox, for he loved a good story even better than he loved a good meal. "'Who are the Greys and Whites, my lad? You never told us anything about this.' "'There's really not much to tell,' sighed Tandy, seating himself on a small stool before the fire. "'In the first place, I suppose you know that the great continent of Tarara is divided into two large long countries. Ozamaland is on the east coast, and Amaland on the west coast.' "'Now I'll just make a note of that,' said Samuel Salt, leaning over to pull his journal toward him. "'My country,' went on Tandy slowly, is made up largely of desert and jungle, best known for its white elephants and camels and the famous white city of Om, first king and ruler of the kingdom. The Zamas are fierce and still wild tribesmen living in tents on the desert and in huts in the jungle. Only the thousand nobles and their families who live in the white city have been taught to read and write and live under roofs. That is why the kings of Ozamaland are so well guarded and never allowed out of the capital." "'Then I'd rather be a tribesman,' sniffed Ato, letting his nets drop in a heap around his feet. "'But there's no choice,' said Tandy thoughtfully. "'The nine Ozamandarians who made the laws have decreed that the king shall remain in the White City.' "'Well, what about these whites and greys?' asked Samuel Salt pulling out his pipe and leaning down close to the fire so Sally could light it for him. My people, because they dress in white robes and turbans, are known as the Whites, and the Amas, the rough plainsmen who rove the long ranges of Amaland, are the Greys. The Amas care for nothing but their swift grey horses, and often charge over the border to make war on my countrymen. Then the Whites, mounted on their white elephants and camels, 
have all they can do to hold their own. Aha! That's what I'd call a real battle, exclaimed Edo, his eyes snapping with enthusiasm and interest. Then, noting Samuel's disapproving frown, he pursed up his lips, shook his head, and added quickly, All very wild and disorderly, Tandy, my lad. Seems as if the whites and grey should manage their affairs more peaceably. Yes, said Tandy solemnly, and I've often thought when I was grown I'd ride over on my white elephant to visit the greys and see why they are so unfriendly. A good idea, and if I were you, I wouldn't wait till I was grown. I'd do it as soon as I got back," advised Samuel Salt, taking a long pull at his pipe. And very probably get himself cut up and captured, shuddered Ato, shaking his head. Well, he's been both shut up and captured anyway, hasn't he? said Samuel mildly. Now which one of your ants do you think had you carried off, matey, and how many ants do you have, anyway?" Three, Tandy answered, counting them off solemnly on his fingers. And they were all pretty and pleasant enough, but after the prophecy of the old man of the jungle that I would be carried off by an ant, they were all locked up in the castle dungeon, and I was locked up in the tower. And resting his elbows on his knees, Tandy gazed soberly into the fire as if he might discover there the reason for his cruel abduction and imprisonment in the jungle. "'If only I'd been awake when I was carried away!' he exclaimed impatiently. "'They probably gave you a sleeping potion,' decided Ato, nodding his head portentously. "'But it's such a longish distance. Unless this ant had wings or a flying eagle, I'll never understand how she shipped you so far and so fast." "'Well, whoever it was did us a real service,' boomed Samuel Salt, twinkling his blue eyes affectionately at Tandy. "'Even Peter was no better aboard a ship, eh, mate?' "'A real artist and a seaman,' agreed Ato, rolling cheerfully to his feet. "'And when we reach Ozamaland, I'll talk to these ants like an octagon uncle, and the Ozamandarans had better hold on to their turbans, too." "'But they wear square hats!' roared Tandy, laughing so hard he almost fell off the stool, for he just could not picture the fat king of the octagon isle berating the haughty judges of Ozamaland. "'What's the joke?' demanded Roger, flying in through the open port and making a straight line for the fire. Brrrr! Ah, wet weather, boys, wet weather! Oh, what a cold and damp and gloomth! Why, I'm moister than an oyster and clammier than a clam! How about a cup of hot chocolate for the watch, cook dear? Better see to your sail, Master Salt. Fog's thicker than bean soup out there. We'll all have some chocolate, said Ato, as Samuel hurried out to see how dense the fog really was. Later, sitting by the stove sipping Ato's delicious hot chocolate, Tandy could not help comparing this cozy life aboard the Crescent Moon with his dull and lonely existence in the royal city of his fathers. "'I wish the Greys would capture the Whites,' he thought vindictively, as he followed Roger across the slippery deck. "'Then I never have to leave this ship.' The kind-hearted reed-bird was carrying a pail of hot chocolate down to Nikobo on the raft. She could not get her great snout into the bucket, but she opened her enormous mouth and with one toss Roger poured the whole pail down her throat. "'That'll keep her warm till morning,' chuckled Roger, flying back to join Tandy. "'And now you'd better turn in, little fellow, for you're on morning watch, and eight bells will be sounding before you know it.' All through his dreams about the whites and greys, Tandy heard the raucous voice of the foghorn, and when he rolled sleepily out of his bunk to relieve Ato, the ship seemed to be hardly moving at all. "'Ahoy, Captain! Isn't a fog dangerous?' Tandy's voice seemed more hopeful than worried, and Samuel Salt, peering down at the little boy buttoned to his chin in Peter's old sou'easter, grinned approvingly. "'Just about as dangerous as a man-eating tiger,' he answered cheerfully. "'We're liable to ram a ship, run on the rocks, or scrape our bottom on a hidden reef or sandbar. These waters, as you know, being all unnavigated. 
but I brought Sally along to keep my nose warm and throw a bit more light on the subject, and we'll have to take our chance, eh, matey? Just step aft and see if you can make out anything astern, will you, Tandy? Four o'clock, or rather eight bells, was always pretty dark, and one had to depend more or less on the ship's lanterns, but this morning was the darkest Tandy had ever experienced. Clinging to the rail, he moved cautiously to the stern and gazed intently down into the gloom. Nothing an inch beyond his nose was visible, and as for the raft in Nicobo, they might just as well not have been there. "'Kobo! Kobo! Are you all right?' There was no answer to Tandy's call, but presently a huge and resounding snore rolled upward, and, greatly comforted, Tandy hurried back to the captain. Samuel Salt was busy lighting extra lanterns, and as he straightened up, a hollow boom, followed by a splintering crash, sent them both sprawling to the deck. Leaping to his feet and unmindful of the glass from the shattered lanterns, Samuel seized an unbroken one and ran furiously to the rail. "'Ship ahoy! Heave to! You blasted son of a cuttlefish lubber! You've rammed us amidships, you blasted billy goat! Where are your lights? Why didn't you sound the horn?' His lantern, held far over the rail, made no impression at all on the choking fog. Jumping up and running after Samuel, Tandy strained his eyes for a glimpse of the ship that had hit them, for unmistakably to his ears came the scrape and rasp of wood on wood. Yes, surely, it was a ship. But no answer to Samuel's hail came out of the fog, only the swish and murmur of the sea and the rattle of wind in the rigging. But all this creaking could not come from the crescent moon alone. There was a ship beyond them in the fog, but where, as Samuel had demanded, were her lights and crew? Wildly, Tandy, hardly knowing what to think or do, continued to blink into the maddening darkness. Ato and Roger, wakened by the horrible jolt, now came hurrying out, each waving a lantern. "'Let go the anchor, mates,' ordered Samuel in a stern voice. "'We're to grips with an enemy ship, so stand by for trouble.' Further shortening his sail, Samuel waited tensely for the first move from their invisible foe. "'Might be pirates.' he whispered out of the corner of his mouth to Tandy, who stood close beside him grasping the scimitar that had once been Peter's. "'Jump the first man aboard!' "'How about a long shot in their general direction?' wheezed Ato, who found the silence and suspense well nigh unbearable. "'No, it's not for us to start a fight,' stated Samuel grimly. "'But ha! Just let them start one. Fetch me my stilts, Roger, and be quick about it, too.' "'Stilts?' choked the reed-bird, dropping the blunderbuss with which he had armed, or rather winged himself. "'You'll never be trying those things again. They nearly shivered our timbers last time. Why take another chance?' "'My stilts!' repeated Samuel savagely, and Roger, who knew his duty as a sailor, flew without further argument to the hold. When Roger returned with a stilt in each claw, the captain grasped one, and moving silently as a cat over to the port rail, he thrust the long pole experimentally out into the fog. There was an instant thud, and Samuel himself got a severe jolt as the stilt struck against some firm and immovable object beyond. Convinced that it was an enemy ship, Samuel returned to the others, and, drawn up in an anxious row, the four shipmates waited for the fog to lift or the first enemy seaman to leap aboard. I'll wager it's a derelict, or an abandoned vessel with no crew," breathed Ado, seating himself on a fire-bucket to somewhat ease the long wait. The first hour Tandy stood fairly well, but the second seemed interminable. The flickering lanterns, the tense quiet, the choking fog and gentle roll of the ship all made him desperately drowsy, and much to his later disgust he must have finally fallen asleep. The next thing he remembered was the shrill squall of the reed-bird and the pleasant feel of the sun on his eyelids. "'The ship! The pirates! The fog!' thought Tandy, springing up wildly, but neither ship nor pirates met his astonished gaze. 
Abaft the beam lay a great whispering deep sea forest, its trees higher than the masts of the ship, springing directly out of the water and stretching their leafy branches to the sky. It was into one of these giant greenwoods the crescent moon had crashed in the fog. Samuel was staring at the sea forest with the rapt look of a scientist who has just made an unbelievable discovery, and Ato, with his elbows resting on the rail, was gazing dreamily in the same direction. "'Hoy! Ahoy! Why, I never knew there were forests in the sea!' exclaimed Handy, running over to insinuate himself between the cook and the captain. "'There aren't. It's just plain impossible,' breathed Ado, moving over to make room for Tandy. "'But impossible or not, there she lies. And isn't it pretty?' he mused, resting more than half of his great weight on the rail. "'I suppose Samuel went to dig up a sea-tree and bring it along,' he leaned over to whisper mischievously in Tandy's ear. "'And anyway, it's better than pirates.' "'Look, look, there's fish in those trees!' screamed Roger, bouncing up and down on Ato's plump shoulder. "'How about some flying fish for breakfast, Cook dear?' "'Breakfast? Breakfast? Can it really be time for breakfast? Oh, hum, I thought I was still asleep and dreaming,' grunted Ato, giving himself a little shake. "'Well, forest or no forest, a man must eat, I suppose.' and still gazing delightedly over his shoulder, the ship's cook trod reluctantly toward the galley, while Tandy hurried into the cabin for his paints. End of chapter 12「Chapter 13 of Captain Salt in Oz This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Captain Salt in Oz by Ruth Plumley Thompson Chapter 13 The Sea Forest Tandy had to call Samuel twice before he would come to breakfast, and when he finally did sit down, he was so busy preparing to explore the sea forest he ate scarcely a bite. "'We'll take the jolly boat,' he decided, making long notes in his journal between his sips of coffee. "'The small nets and knives and baskets for cuttings and any specimens we may pick up, and—' "'Why the jolly boat when we have a jolly sea-going hippopotamus?' inquired Roger, elevating one eyebrow. "'A jolly hippopotamus, I might add who runs under her own power and saves us the trouble of rowing. Roger was much annoyed because he had failed to catch a flying fish before breakfast, and instead of eating his hard-boiled eggs, kept winging over to the open port to glare at his finny rivals. Tandy, like the captain, was too excited to eat, and even Ado downed his omelette and fresh strawberries from the pecan-spire fruit vine with rare speed and indifference. "'It's a lucky thing you're so enormous, Kobo,' puffed the ship's cabin-boy, dropping down on the raft a few minutes later. ato has got his crab-nets and fishing-lines, Samuel's bringing an aquarium, a couple of baskets and a box, and I have this pail, my paints and a cage, in case Roger does manage to catch one of those flying fish.' Kobo was staring fixedly at her vegetable vine as Tandy dropped down beside her and now, snapping off a whole bushel of beans, she turned round and, munching contentedly, surveyed the excited boy at her side. "'Whatever you have can be hung to my harness,' she assured him, speaking a bit thickly through the beans. "'But turn the point of that scimitar up instead of down. You wouldn't want to carve old Kobo, now would you? It will seem funny swimming through a forest, won't it, little king?' The further we go on this voyage, the queerer everything grows." "'But I like it queer,' stated Tandy, climbing with a satisfied little sigh on Nikobo's broad back. "'I too find it most interesting and jolly,' agreed the hippopotamus, fastening her eyes dreamily on the vegetable vine to see what was coming up next. "'I thought I might be on short rations when I came on this voyage, Tandy 
but I declare to goodness I've never had such a rich and varied diet in my life. You too look fine and strong, and much happier than when we met in the jungle. But to get back to the fair, why, today I've had a basket of biscuits, a bushel of beans. And that makes it bean and biscuit day, I suppose, giggled Tandy, remembering Kobo's strange way of dividing up her week. But look, listen, here they come. Ahoy below! Hip, hip, hippopotamus, ahoy! roared Samuel Salt jovially from above. All ready to cast off, my lass? Aye, aye, sir, grinned Kobo, as Samuel and Ato came panting down the rope ladders to the raft. Move over, Tandy, and make room for the cook and the captain. It took nearly ten minutes to get all the gear and crew aboard, and Nikobo looked like some curious deep-sea monster when she finally shoved off. Two large baskets were slung from ropes across her back. The pail and birdcage slapped up and down on one hip, the aquarium on the other, and through her collar various fishing-rods, nets, and poles were stuck like quills on a porcupine. "'Now whatever you do, don't submerge,' warned Samuel holding his tin box for especially fragile specimens high above his chest to keep it dry. "'Just slow and steady, my lass, so we'll have time to observe and admire and make notes of any strange growths and creatures as we ride along.' "'Creatures!' exclaimed Tandy, twisting round. He was perched on Nikobo's head, his paints held carefully in his lap. "'Would there be any wild animals in a sea-forest, Master Salt?' "'Sea lions, likely,' predicted Samuel, peering round eagerly as Nikobo paddled between two slippery barked sea-trees into the murmuring forest itself. Except for the fact that the floor of this curious sea-wood was the blue and restless sea, it might almost have been a forest ashore. The trees, tall, straight, and stately, towered up toward the sky. Staring down into the clear green water, Tandy saw their trunks going down, 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 as far as he could see. "'Rooted in the very ocean bed,' marveled Samuel Salt, touching one lovingly as they passed. "'What splendid masts these would make, mates! Avast and belay, Nicobo! I believe I'll just take a cutting or two. "'Ha, ha!' roared Ato, peering over Samuel's shoulder. "'So now we're going to grow our own masts.' Samuel himself, leaning far out over Nikobo's back, severed three young shoots from the sea-tree and popped them happily into the aquarium. Vines that were really of coral ringed the gigantic trunks like bracelets, and the leaves of the trees were long ribbons of green and silver that whipped and fluttered like banners in the morning breeze. "'What's that?' puzzled Ato, as the hippopotamus made her way leisurely between the trees. Looks like mushrooms, Sammy. Wait, I'll just pick me a few and see." Hooking his heels in Nikobo's harness, Ato began vigorously cutting from the trunk of one of the trees the colored fungus growths which sprouted in great profusion just above the water-line. Nikobo bravely offered to sample some, and, after waiting anxiously to see whether they would have any ill effects on the ship's cook, decided they were harmless and joyfully filled one of the baskets. The only specimens that really interested Ato were of the edible variety. While he was thus employed, Tandy, an experienced climber by now, scurried up to the top of one of the sea-trees, breaking off several branches so Samuel could press the curious leaves in his album. High above his head Tandy could see Roger chasing angrily after a flying fish, muttering with anger at his unsuccessful efforts to overtake the nimble little seabird. In our own southern waters there are large flying fish that leap out of the water of the Gulf Stream, but the flying fish in this nonstick sea forest were small, and where most fish have gills, wore strong transparent wings. Their claws, somewhat like a crab's, made it possible for them to perch jauntily in the branches of the sea-trees, and these strange little fellows could swim and dive as well as fly. Pulling out his pad, Tandy made a lively sketch of one in the tree opposite, for it did look as if Roger would never succeed in catching one. All morning Nikobo paddled calmly through the dreamy sea-forest, Samuel making notes, Tandy sketches, 
and Ato catching in his long-handled nets plump little fish and crabs, and filling another basket with the small delicious clams that clung like barnacles to the slippery bark of the sea-trees. In the shadowy center of the forest, where the trees pressed closer together and great flat rocks stuck their heads out of the water, the explorers came upon several fierce sea-lions. They were not smooth and shiny like the seals of our own oceans, but yellow and tawny, with long yellow tusks, tufted tails, and scaly manes. Their front legs ended in sharp claws, their back legs were shorter, and their feet were webbed for swimming. Only the fact that Nicoba was larger and more frightening to the sea-lions than they were to her saved the party from a savage attack by these malicious-looking monsters. As it was, they retired sullenly into the deeper shadows, snarling and roaring defiance as they backed away, but not before Tandy had made an effective sketch of the whole group. "'Tis a lucky thing for us that you're along,' grunted Ato, drawing his feet up out of the water and looking with grim disfavor after the snarling sea-lions. "'Likely as not, if you had not made that picture, Samuel would have tried to drag one along by its tail, regardless of our feelings or safety. "'A wild main sea-lion would be a valuable addition to any collection,' sighed Samuel Salt, shaking his head regretfully. "'But then—' He grinned in his sudden pleasant way. "'Not much of a mascot at that.' The only other happening of note was Roger's capture of a monkey-fish. Unable to overtake a flying-fish, the reed-bird had pounced on this small combination of a land and water beast as it sat quietly sunning itself on the limb of a tree. Screaming and chattering, he bore it proudly down to the captain, and Samuel was so pleased with the curious little creature that when Nicobo suggested going back he made no serious objection. And as the hippopotamus, rather weary from her long swim, headed thankfully back for the ship, Tandy and Samuel made ambitious plans for the monkey-fish's care and comfort. Thrusting it into Tandy's birdcage, Samuel regarded it with increasing enthusiasm and interest. "'I'll rig up a wooden tree in one of the aquariums, set the aquarium in one of the large cages so it'll have both air and water, and call it Roger after its discoverer,' beamed the former pirate with a wink at Tandy. "'Don't you dare call that monkey-fish after me!' screeched the reed-bird, flying round to have another look at his strange prize. "'Why, it's uglier than a blue monkey! Looks like a regular goblin, if you ask me!' And to tell the truth, the monkey-fish was even uglier than a goblin, shaped like a monkey but scaled all over, and with unpleasant goggly eyes and three short spikes sticking out of its forehead. It does look like a goblin, agreed Tandy, with an amused sniff. But let's call it Mophie, which is short for fish and monkey. Tip topsails, approved Samuel Salt, taking out his notebook. Wonder what it eats. Great grandmothers, what would it eat? moaned Ato, looking blankly at Samuel. Another mouth to feed and listen to. Dear, dear, and dear. "'Oh, give it a box of animal crackers,' put in Roger carelessly. "'No, I brought along some goldfish foo for just such an emergency as this,' declared Samuel, making a little flourish with his pencil as he wrote busily in his journal. "'Goldfish food would be splendid for a monkey-fish.' "'Well, don't forget the bananas, for remember, it's a monkey, too,' chirped Roger, settling on the captain's shoulder to read what he had written. So, laughing and joking, and in the highest good humor, the exploring party returned to the crescent moon. What with planting the slips from the sea-tree, settling Mophi in his aquarium cage, pressing the leaves from the marine forest, and making copies and further notes about the sea-lions in his journal, Samuel did not get his ship under way till late afternoon. Ramming into the sea-tree, beyond scraping off some paint, had done little damage. So, singing boisterously, Samuel finally heaved up his anchor. And soon, with Ato stirring up a huge clam chowder, Tandy painting the sea forest on the chart, and Roger scouring the hold for Mophie's fish food, the crescent moon again dipped adventurously into the southeast swell. 
End of chapter 13